just uh, kick off the evening. It's eight o'clock, and uh, a welcome voucher to everybody here, Fester Ma. Uh, for those that don't know me, I'm Colin McCauley. I'm a local councillor, and I'm convener of the, the local SNP branch. Uh, tonight, I wanted to begin by reading just a very short extract from Leslie Riddle's excellent book called Blossom. It's uh, her own account of Scotland at the grassroots, and just uh, a, a, a small extract. In international terms, Scotland is more often exceptional for all the wrong reasons. We have sub-East European health outcomes, ghettos of near unemployable people, an indoors culture, and high rates of addiction and self-harming behaviour. Scotland also has the smallest number of people owning the largest amounts of land, the lowest proportion standing for election, and the largest local authorities with the least genuinely local control of tax and resources in Europe. We have one of the biggest income gaps between rich and poor. And although no one has done the research, I'd also guess we have the least outdoorsy population, the smallest number of boat owners per mile of coastline, and a high number of children who aren't sure eggs come from hens. So, is Scotland's enduring ability to punch below its weight caused by our lack of statehood or is it the other way around? And it is, a, you know, it's, it's, it's Leslie Riddock's book, and it's very much just her meeting people and talking about Scotland. But uh, if people have got the time, the inclination, recommend it, recommend it to you. Following on from that setting of the scene, I'm really delighted to introduce Stephen Gethins to you this evening. Not only is Stephen one of the SNP's Euro candidates for the May elections, but he's also a near knight um, on his mum's side. We headlined tonight's public meeting as Stop the World Scotland Wants to Get On, a tribute to Winnie Ewing's famous speech from 1967. And given the recent focus in the media on Europe and the currency union, I don't think we could have chosen a more appropriate guest for this evening than Stephen. He's been a special advisor to our First Minister, a political advisor to the EC's Committee of the Regions, He's worked at Scotland Europa and he was involved in the USA's International Visitor Leadership Programme. Respected internationally, academically and politically, Stephen is currently the convener of the advisory board of Scottish Global Forum. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, other places have got Jim Sillers, Business for Scotland, a big meeting in Inverness as well tonight, but near has Stephen Gettins. <laughs> Thanks very much. Would it be handy? I mean, I can stand here or I can stand at the lectern, whichever is easiest for us tonight. I might just stand here. So is that, is that, is that, is that okay for you? That's good, eh? But first of all, thanks very much for um, having me in there. It's really nice to be back here again. Um, I've been up to Nairn for, for, for years and years. My mum um, was born here and then she, she, she spent um, many of her early years in, in Old Air, just along the road and just very close to, to Liz McDonald. Where, where, um, We've just had my dinner, um, and so so it was lovely. Um, Colin, thanks for the introduction. I'll, I'll I'll tell you just a little bit about myself, just to give you a little bit of of, of, of my background. Um, as as I talk about some of the areas I want to talk about, I also want to talk about a little bit about how Scotland might look in the world if, if we're independent. How how would an independent Scotland, if you like, fit in to the world? Um, in particular, I'd like to talk about the European Union and how we'd work. In the European Union, because as, as well, when I was a special advisor, I used to attend a number of council meetings. I also worked inside the European Union as an official for a number of years. And finally, one of the things I'd like to talk about, and I think this is particularly appropriate for Nair in this area, is Scotland's global niche. Um, because the world is a, is a competitive marketplace, and I think we have to start thinking about where our, where our niche is in the world. And I think that applies for people who are going to vote yes or are going to vote no. Um, so, just give you a little bit of background about myself. I am an SNP candidate for the Euro, so obviously I'm a, I'm a yes supporter, I'm an enthusiastic yes supporter, and always have been. Um, my, my previous role was as a special advisor in government, which is a political role in government. So as an SNP advisor appointed by Alex Salmond, there were about eight of us in the first government, and we expanded our, our roles afterwards, and I covered a number of different areas um, in, in government, including EU and international affairs, as well as areas such as energy and climate change and rural affairs, um, the whole idea of a special advisor is to keep the civil service, to, give the, to, to ensure the civil service are still independent and uh, you, you act as the bridge between the party, if you like, and in government. Um, and there are a lot fewer of us. I remember there was one of me covering um, 
three different cabinet secretaries, which were about 15 of them, it would have been 15 of them down at Westminster, so you cover quite a broad range of issues. At, um, at the moment I'm chairing an organisation called the Scottish Global Forum, that brings together former British diplomats, it brings together former EU Commission officials and other interested parties, including journal foreign affairs correspondents. The whole idea is to provide a forum so that people can talk about where Scotland's going. And there's a huge opportunity, and, and this, is, this is part of it, um, having meetings like this, having the opportunity to talk to you today, is a part of talking about where we see Scotland going and what kind of Scotland we want to see emerge on the 19th of September. Now clearly I want to see an independent Scotland emerge on the 19th of September. I think that's the best thing for our country. I think that's the best thing for our future. But I also think we have an opportunity to talk about if we are independent, what kind of independent Scotland are we going to have. So go and have a look at www.scottishglobalforum.net and chuck in your views and have a read of some of the, the very learned and eminent people who've, who've, who've put, put their pieces in there as well. Um, just to give you other uh, background, before I worked in the European Union, I worked in the former Soviet Union as well as the Balkans on inter-ethnic conflict. So working in areas um, just down the road from where the Sochi Olympics are at the moment, in one of Europe's most fascinating areas, um, the Caucasus is perhaps is the most ethnically diverse part of Europe. Um, and in the world, it's, it sort of uh, compares to unexplored Amazonia and um, Papua New Guinea in terms of its inter-ethnic area. It also has a, a close link to, well, not that close link, but also has a link to Scotland in the Declaration of Our Growth. Um, Robert the Bruce, when he was writing to the Pope, said um, that the Scots originally came from Scythia, which is now the Caucasus. So when you're watching the Sochi Olympics and you see the curlers have effectively played a home crowd down there. <laughs> um, but it's a fascinating part of the world and, 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 and do have a look. Anyway, how, how would Scotland look? And this is something that, that fascinates me. Um, I see a lot, if I can diverge from what some of my colleagues on, on the yes side would argue, a lot of them argue about Scotland being a small country. Um, I'd argue with that. And actually, if you look in global terms, Scotland's um, almost like Goldilocks country. It's, it's, it's not too big, it's, it's, it's not too little, it's kind of somewhere in the middle. So Scotland sits quite snugly between Singapore and Norway in terms of its population, uh, about 110 out of about 200 countries in the world, roughly speaking. In European terms, um, you've got countries ranging in size from Malta with about 350,000-400,000 inhabitants to Germany with about 83 million inhabitants. And Scotland sits nicely alongside similar sized countries such as Denmark, Slovakia, Ireland, Finland, all of them similar sized and what I'd like to describe normal sized countries actually. Um, and People can have their own views on this, but I, I, I think that, that, that we paint Scotland incorrectly when we call it a small country. Um, so that's, that's right about where, where, where we sit in the world, and I think sometimes it's really important to think about that. Um, where we also sit globally, and this is something that's, that's quite important to learn, is that we sit in an increasingly important part of the world um, ge um, geostrategically as well. One thing is, is that we've seen the floods down in England, um, climate change, and it's something that this part of the world knows all about as well. Uh, things are changing. One, one consequence of this is, and it's something the Americans and the Russians are really starting to open up on, is what are the consequences for the opening up of the, the northern sea routes. And that's something that will have significant impact on things like Nair and in this part of the world in particular. And I think we need to start having a think about how do we respond to those changes as well. Um, if I can talk just briefly about the European Union and some of my experiences sitting inside the European Union. As I said, Scotland has about 5.3 million people. Um, it's been argued in the past that, and it's, it's argued continually, that Scotland left the United Kingdom that somehow we'd have less clout. Now I'd argue with that on a number of areas. One of them is under the new Lisbon Treaty. Um, countries like Malta have exactly the same number of votes on a large number of areas as countries like Germany. Even when they don't, under qualified majority voting, the UK at the moment has got, and I was having a look at this earlier on, has got about 29 votes when you're making decisions, and um, that's a big one. All the big countries have about 29 votes. The next lot of countries that we like have 27 votes. Denmark, Slovakia and Finland have seven votes in this area. Now it all sounds quite techy, but I'm, I'm, I'm going somewhere with this. Um, as well as the critically important role of being your own member state in Europe is the most important thing. 
And it's most important because it gives you your own commissioner to argue your case in the Commission. It gives you um, double the number of MEPs in the European Parliament, and I, I suppose I have a personal interest in that, but uh, which, which I've already declared. But critically, and this is absolutely vital, it also gives you that seat at the top table in the Council of Ministers, whereas regardless of what you read in the press on a day-to-day -day basis, very little can happen in the European Union without the consent of the Member State. And big decisions are always being made in the sort of Council of Ministers. Now, the UK's got 29 votes at the moment. Um, at the moment, Scotland gets 29 votes in areas where we agree with the UK. In areas where we don't agree with the UK, the UK, as has been shown consistently in the past, will not vote in the Scottish interest. It will vote in what it considers to be the broader UK interest, whether you agree with it or not, because Scotland is a small peripheral part of the United Kingdom. If we were independent, we would have, if you combine the votes, we'd have 29 plus 7, because the UK would still be fair, fairly big, you'd have 36 votes compared to the 29 votes at the moment. Where we disagree, you'd have 7 votes where you have no votes at the, at, at the moment. And just to give you some examples of where this has happened over the years, for instance, the Scottish Government position on GM crops, for example. Now, I'm not asking you to agree or disagree with GM crops, but that's where the democratically elected Government of Scotland has a position on GM crops, which differs from that in the UK. The UK will always vote in favour of GM crops, thus going against the votes of the Scottish Government because they are the member state and it's their right to do so at the moment. Um, in the past, and as this area knows better than most areas in, um, in, in Europe, you've had the, fishing, the, the common fisheries policy, which from an environmental perspective and an economic perspective has been a disaster for the continent. There are very, very few people who would argue otherwise. In the 1970s, when the UK was negotiating entry into the UK, it argued that the UK's broader interest, that Scotland's fishermen and Scotland's fishing industry could be considered, and I'm quoting here, directly quoting the UK government, could be considered expendable. This is something that's gone on in future years. I remember when we were in government, the um, Richard Lockhead, uh, the cabinet secretary from the constituency just next door, lives along, uh, along in Elgin, we consistently, he represents, remember, 70% of the UK's fishing industry, consistently try and get the top seat. We'd never get given it. The day before the UK general election in 2010, the UK ministers, quite rightly, were all entirely taken up with their general election. Richard Lockhead even offered to go to a really critical meeting over reform of common fisheries policy on behalf of the UK and even said to them, look, I'll agree a line with you. I'll agree a line with you. We don't agree on everything, but let's agree on something and I'll make that case. And they sent um, somebody from the House of Lords who was Minister for Bees instead, who had absolutely no, no sort of um, um, locus of, of, over fishing. So as well as all that, as well as having more votes and a greater say in Europe, and whether you agree with Europe or you disagree with Europe, if you're going to be in the European Union, it's really important to our day-to-day -day lives. It has a huge impact on things that happen on a day-to-day -day basis. So if you're going to be in there, you need the strongest possible voice. Now, I'd argue that areas that Scotland misses out on at the moment, as well as um, having a strong voice in fisheries, you've also got Scotland a vital food and drink industry, with Scottish farmers set to lose hundreds of millions of euros over the next financial year because we're caught up in a UK system, which means that we get judged in the UK system. And per agriculture area in Scotland, Scotland's at the bottom. Absolutely, it's at the bottom within the UK, it says bottom within Europe of how much money our farmers get. And we've got food and drink industry, which is the envy of Europe, which is growing, which is providing jobs here and providing jobs across the country, and has been a fantastic success story, um, even during the, the, the deepest period of recession. There's also the energy industry. Now, at the moment, the UK is moving towards nuclear power, very, very expensive form of, of, of power as well. There's an EU element in that as well, which is the EU went towards setting legally binding targets for 2020. England needs Scotland's renewables to meet its targets. The EU has started putting a great deal of money into it as Germany turns its back on nuclear energy, and they're looking at the different sources of renewables. Now, Scotland, as well as being the richest country in the European Union in terms of its hydrocarbon resources, is also, and you can look at a wind map or you can walk outside, whichever you choose, is also uh, has the greatest renewables potential in terms of our wind, also in terms of our tidal power and our wave power as well. Just along the road at White Ness, obviously, prime location of an area that could really be benefiting from the renewables, bringing high quality jobs, 
that are also, are, are, you, you can also export the skills um, globally as well, in, in a way which, to be fair, the oil and gas industry is doing. I spent a bit of time in Azerbaijan, and um, there were a lot of northeast accents, northeast of Scotland accents in the streets of Azerbaijan, for example. So we miss out there by having that strong voice in an area where we have a commercial niche, where we, an area where we have the edge on competition. <coughs> because this is a crucial thing, and it's something I'm going to come to in just a minute on global niche. In the European Union, you're now competing with 28 member states and what are considered to be 300 regions. And regions go all the way from Scotland to a small, a, a small town somewhere that's got European representation. So we need a competitive edge, and we've got a competitive edge. It's in our food and drink industry, it's in our energy industry, you've got success of oil and gas, now leading over to the success of renewables, which is backed up. Areas like life sciences, Scotland has that competitive edge, but I'd argue, and I've witnessed it firsthand, our competitive edge has not been argued for. And that's worth hundreds of millions of euros in investment, as well as the political clout that comes with it. On a global niche, in terms of global, I've talked about the Northern strategy that I think we need to be thinking about, and we need to be thinking about how we benefit from that. Because we might not, we might want to tackle climate change, but the, the sea, sea routes are opening up. Now, the UK is clearly not looking at that. In fact, you had a Russian, um, you had a Russian warship in the Murray Firth just a few weeks ago. The defence industry had absolutely no idea how to respond to. In fact, it couldn't respond to it because there were no UK ships in the vicinity. And in fact, on Austrian television, I saw somebody put up a clip of Austrian television of Russian sailors just a few miles from here making fun of the UK's defence just off the coast, just off, just off the coast, the, north, the northeast coast here. So we need to look at our niche. Um, one of them is obviously peace building. Scotland's got fantastic global brands. People are really keen to come here. Um, there are already people who are starting out the work. I did some of the Caucasus. We brought people from the Caucasus over to Scotland. Another one's in renewables. Another one could be in defence. At the moment, the Danish army, which has um, the Danish military, spends about two and a half billion pounds a year on its defence, and it's got, it's got quite an aggressive um, defence policy that sends a lot of troops overseas to on, on international missions. Also, with a naval presence, Scotland's contribution, just its contribution, not as assets, its contribution to the defence, um, to, to defence every year in the UK, is three and a half billion with that extra billion going on a number of things, one of which will be the significant cost of the Trident nuclear deterrent, which costs 100 billion pounds over its lifetime. Just to give you a picture of 100 billion pounds, the Scottish government's grant every year to pay for all local authority services, all your health services, schools, transport, and everything else that falls within the scope of the Scottish government is about 30 billion. So it's about a third of what Trident will cost over its, over its lifetime. So we've got an opportunity here. We've got an opportunity in terms of having a think right now, right now, not on the 19th of September, but right now, and having a conversation with what kind of Scotland do we want to see emerge from it. And that's where I personally think the independence message has the strongest message. We've got the European elections coming up, and there'll be a debate focused on Europe, and we'll have to talk to people about Europe. And we've got the opportunity to talk about how Scotland would look in the European Union with these hard facts. And we're talking facts here. We're not talking about how it might be or it might not be, we're talking about how it is. And finally, what's our global niche? And I think that that's the one area where you can maybe start to take out the politics, and we should all be having a contribution to that conversation about what kind of Scotland we'd, we want to see in the future. Anyway, I, I want to keep it uh, tight so we can have a chance to have a conversation, and I'm really happy to take any questions. But thank you for coming along, and thank you for your, uh, for your attention as well. Thank you.